Um, so let's get started. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, welcome, everyone, to join us for today's book talk. And I am He Mingxiao. I'm the director of the Research Institute for Humanity and Social Science. We are a unit under Taiwan's Na National Science and Technology Council, and we primarily provide service and grants for domestic uh, scholars. But increasingly, we are expanding our outreach toward to encourage more international scholarly exchange. And today, we are very ple pleased to have a uh, uh, this uh, book talk, uh, the 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 talk of, uh, the speaker will be Dr. Wu Jianming. Wu Jianming is a research fellow in an uh, Institute of Sociology in Academia Sinica, Taiwan, and the book he is going to share with us is titled "The Rival Partners: How Taiwanese Entrepreneurs and Guangdong Officials Forge China's Development." And the book is recently published by Harvard University Press. And this book is quite special because uh, uh, Dr. Wu has accumulated over 30 years of field work study in China. In this book has a previous incarnation, which is published in 2019 under the title Xunzhu Zhongguo, published by National Taiwan University. And this book has has won many awards, uh, including uh, Academia Sinica's Book Award, and also Dr. Wu Jiaming won a, a award in excellence in research uh, by, by National Science and Technology Council. So it is very uh, unusual that uh, a book first published in Chinese again have, can then be translated in, into English. So this really help out uh, to reach out for more broader audience. And also join in us today are two discussions. Uh, the first one is Dr. Michelle uh, Xie. Uh, Xie Fei Yu. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Xie is also uh, a re associate research fellow in the uh, Institute of Soci Sociology at Dimega Senior. Uh, he is a specialist in economic sociology on Taiwan's industrial uh, growth. And the second discussion is uh, Hong Ho Feng, uh, uh, or the Mandarin is uh, Kong Gao Feng. He is a named professor in political sociology in Johns Hopkins University. He writes extensively on China's political economy and is widely recognized as an authority in this regard. So we really appreciate him to join us in Baltimore and knowing that it is right now in his late evening hours. So today we'll start, uh, I think these two discussions actually make a very nice pair uh, because one is focusing on Taiwan, the other is focused on China. And this book actually talk about the relationship between Taiwanese merchants and the Chinese officials. So it's a very nice complementary perspective that we are going to have. So we'll start it, uh, first with uh, uh, Dr. Wu Jiaming uh, to share the book for 30 minutes. And then each discussion will have 20 minutes. So the whole event will ex is expected to last 90 minutes. So we are anticipating uh, uh, Q&A minutes after the discussion. So without further ado, uh, let's invite uh, Dr. Wu Jiaming. So over to you, Jiaming. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, Ming Xiu's kind introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased to present my research findings on this uh, very special occasion prepared by the center. Um, uh, can you turn to the next uh, page, please? I published this book uh, in Chinese uh, as a title of uh, Xunzhu Zhongguo in uh, 2019, four years ago. And uh, the publisher requested an expanded edition just this past March. Uh, so you can, two, uh, you can see the two uh, Chinese uh, edition uh, book covers. And uh, the bottom one is the, the one just out. And the English edition was released last December. And I changed the title uh, from uh, Xunzhu Zhongguo to Rival Partners because uh, my English uh, publisher uh, discussed with me and, and they think uh, the Xunzhu itself, when seeking itself, the, the, the idea, the title is quite uh, difficult to understand intuitively for the American audience. Uh, next, please. What is the book about? 
uh, it tackles the issue of Taiwanese enterprises in China, specifically examining the role of Taiwan in China's economic development and its the Taishan's, Taiwan's contribution to export-oriented growth since the late 80s. Simply put, I argue that there would be, would be no Guangdong model without Taiwanese investments, uh, known as Taishan, uh, and that the rise of uh, China would not have been possible without the Guangdong development, without the Guangdong model. So this study places Taiwan at the center of Chinese uh, export-led growth for over two decades. However, why is Taiwan so often underestimated or neglected? Primarily for several reasons. First, the CCP, Zonggong, does not want to stress Taiwan's contribution to Chinese economy. And secondly, the issue of Taishan uh, is very sensitive in Taiwan too. And most critically, scholars have not had yet to pay due emphasis on the role and function of Taishan. Next, please. This book is organized into seven chapters with an introduction and conclusion. Chapter two explains the origin of the Guangdong model and provides an overall assessment of Guangdong development. In chapter uh, chapter three and four, I use a Taiwanese investment company, it's called Taiyang, in Guangdong to describe the process by which Taiwanese introduced global value chains into China and explain the collaboration mechanism uh, between foreign investors and the Chinese local governments, local officials. Chapter five, I explain the citizenship regime Regarding Taiwanese, uh, regarding Taiwanese investors in in China, uh, while Chapter Six analyzes Guangdong under transformation from the mid old to the recent years. Finally, in uh, Chapter Seven, uh, I offer a few theoretical reflections. I put the Chinese style rent seeking into a theoretical perspective and propose a concept of a rent-seeking developmental state. Next, please. So how did Taiwanese capital help boost uh, China's historic growth initially? Taishan uh, ushered in the global value chains or supply chains into the country, uh, including manufacturing skills, technology, organizational skills, access, to the Western markets and more. As a result, we can observe China's rise from a Taiwanese perspective. With Taishan providing an excellent narrative frame, the figure on this slide shows a roadmap of the sequence of our selected events. I think they are, they are most uh, links uh, in this causal mechanism. I try to explain to you uh, I, I did in my book. Uh, so this is quite, quite a simplified version of it. Since the 1980s, uh, global value chains began to shift in the, in the East Asian region from the four tigers to China and also to Southeast Asia. The fourth wave of the GVC shift was mostly in the labor intensive traditional industries, such as shoes, bicycles, garments, and textiles, and the toys. And then they mainly went to Guangdong uh, in southern China. And then Hong Kong and Taiwanese manufacturers were significant drivers in this global capital shift. Then it comes the second wave. The second wave of mainland fever, so to speak, uh, came about in the late 90s and centered on ICT assembly and component factories. Taiwan played a leading role in the GVC shift once again, with Taishan serving as a bridge between China and global uh, capitalism and helping China connect with the world. The Chinese government seized this opportunity to integrate into the global value chain and make China the world's factory. At this stage, local growth alliances were formed across coastal China. 
the core members of these cross alliance, alliances were Taishan and other foreign capital, along with local governments and the GVC lead firms and the central government were kind of invisible members of the alliances. Then um, foreign investments completely transformed the Chinese economic structure. The coast of China became an export-oriented economy and the export processing sector became an engine of growth. The Chinese government gained an enormous amount of foreign exchange, which laid a foundation for China's economic rise. Grain seeking activity has been pervasive in this celebrated China model, but curiously, it hasn't uh, it's, it hasn't seemed to hamper economic growth. A certain kind of rent seeking differs from the typical uh, situation in China. I define it as institutional rent seeking. Institutional rent seeking uh, is a term I coined actually for, for, for some years. Local officials organize themselves into cartels to sponsor enterprises and collect processing and uh, management management fees. But the fees charged to the foreign companies were not limited to processing fees. Actually, there are many different items to be collected uh, on the foreign investors. It sounds this pattern of collaboration works smoothly, but there's a, a dark side to this cross alliance. It actually, it includes migrant workers. The, the workers that have produced the largest economic surplus in this labor-intensive growth model have been deprived of the most econ economic rewards and uh, social welfare. Then since China's economic rise, the government has constantly pushed the rapid upgrading. For example, Guangdong has been carrying out a strategy uh, called uh, which means empty the cages and uh, change birds since the late odds. This together with the sudden shock of the global financial crisis during the 2007 and 8 put tremendous pressure on Taishan and other foreign companies and it eventually resulted in the reorganization of this local growth alliance. During this period, the central government pushed for the rate supply chain and the Made in China 2025. This series of upgrading strategies intends to challenge the technological hegemony of the West and bypass and trying to bypass the global value chains by creating China's own supply chain system. It's new. China's new economic prowess has made it uh, very assertive and even aggressive, not only economically, but also militarily and diplomatically. And we from Taiwan can, can feel the, the heat very much every day in its international, uh, China's international behavior. The US initially opened its market, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, initially opened its market to China and invited China into this EOI development model. But 30 years later, um, the US is finding its interest threatened by China and has begun to change its long-term engagement policy. Therefore, the US has redefined China as a, as a strategic uh, competitor or a rival and is imposing sanctions in recent years on Chinese firms such as Huawei, uh, uh, whose headquarters are in Guangdong and, and uh, SMIC SMIC uh, in Shanghai. And, and it's uh, it is largest semiconductor manufacturer in China. This is the historical process we found ourselves in now. Therefore, the rival partnership, the title of this book, you know, the image, between Taishan and the Chinese officials became more and more expressive. Uh, next page, please. So how important have Taishan been for the Chinese export economy? Uh, below are just a few facts. First, 
Taishan have been leaders in the export processing sector and have helped create numerous foreign earnings. In 2021, the, uh, this figure is uh, three years ago, Taishan took six of the top 10 spots for exporters in China. Additionally, Guangdong has been the leading province in exports and in, in making earning the foreign exchange. Secondly, Taishan are the largest uh, foreign investor employers in the export sector with significant employment effects. In, 20, uh, in 2006 and uh, 2011, for this uh, respective years, Taishan and Hong Kong companies employed over 10 million workers, which was almost half of the labor employed in the foreign invested sector in Chinese cities. Thirdly, supply chain indigenous indigenization and internationalization. Um, Taishan have helped cultivate many mainland invested factories and enterprise groups from footwear to ICT. For example, Luxor, uh, Li Xin, Luxor. Four spas, uh, Wang Lai Chun, uh, Ms. Wang, used to be work at Foxconn uh, two, days, two decades ago. And, 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 and Luxor has become, now become a significant supplier in Apple's supply chain. Moreover, the Taiwanese semiconductor sector has become a target for China to acquire products and the technologies, including manufacturing, manufacturing skills, uh, chip design, and the Chinese companies are now uh, working really hard to poach talent from Taiwan. Uh, next, please. As I mentioned, there was a gross alliance between the Chinese side and foreign investors. But how did they work it out? I delve into the exchanges between local officials and foreign ca capital under the surface and also behind the closed doors. I use the Taiyang company, a Taiwanese invest factory as a major case study. I follow this company uh, from Taiwan to Hong Kong then to Guangdong and then back to Taipei again for nearly uh, 20 years. The study aimed to uncover Taiyang's cooperation with the Chinese side. In brief, uh, both parties formed a fictive joint venture company, or you can call it a fake joint venture company, if you will. However, the Taiwanese wholly owned the company, which means that the Chinese side didn't spend a penny on this company. And the, the, but what, what, does, what did the Chinese partner do to the company? The Chinese partner provided protection, actually political pro protection and a relatively credible commitment to a stable management environment. Next, please. Um, on this table, I, I, I will show you the head tax and other fees paid by Taiyang to the Chinese authorities. And here are just a few items. Uh, now, here we have, to, um, we have seven items, okay? Um, but actually, uh, when I did my field work in, in China, the managers in Taiyang, they show me many times all the items they have to pay uh, to the local authorities uh, with different branches of the government and uh, collectively and even for some uh, individual, um, you know, behaviors. Um, but, but here I focus on the institutional uh, rent seeking and uh, um, we can see the head tax is the most conspicuous, uh, item seven. The head tax is most conspicuous in this list. The nickname head, head tax refers to the processing free remittance spread. Uh, the spread means the difference between the official rate and the market rate of the uh, foreign exchange. Uh, rather than, an, it's not a actual tax, in Guangdong, the fees were paid through a very complicated formula based on the foreign exchange retention share. Uh, in Chinese, it's called Waiwei uh, Wenchen. It's a very, very complicated uh, uh, um, process involving many partners. 
So um, Taiyan company has paid its local partner on, uh, it paid its local partner uh, over a million yuan annually for many years. So you can imagine the, the amount of the, the, the rent paid to its Chinese partner. Uh, you may find the details of this practice and its variations across regions and over time in the book if you want to understand it better. Uh, next, please. The most noteworthy characteristic of the Chinese style rent seeking society is the collective organized and the institutional rent seeking activities of the local officials. Officials' collective rent seeking behavior is closely related to China's industrial policies and incentive mechanisms granted by the central government. For the Chinese, uh, for the foreign companies under study, the local government operates like a mafia cartel that provides a degree of credible commitment. But we have, uh, we have been uh, heeded here, you know. This commitment is contingent on state policies and it can become volatile and unpredictable amid rapid state policy changes. Next, please. The outcomes. The outcomes of the Chinese development model are apparent. Uh, first of all, China's manufacturing capacity has become outstanding and the enormous foreign exchange earnings laid the foundation for Chinese economic upgrading projects and external uh, expansion. China has created a rent-seeking developmental state that was instrumental in the labor intensive. I have to uh, stress here, it's very uh, important and instrumental in the labor intensive export economy. However, this model was relatively exhausted itself and it has now trapped China. Structural imbalances are now hinder the country's further uh, development. Despite this, uh, China continues to try a, a big push upgrading strategy and attract, continues to attract Taiwanese capital and talent, especially in the semiconductor sector as discussed above. Next, please. But this is uh, in view of my conclusion. I will conclude with a few words on theoretical innovation. This book connects Taishan studies with three sets of literature. Uh, the first one is global commodity chain or global value chain theories. The second set is citizenship theories. And the third set is developmental state studies. With, with, the, with this global local linkage, we can see Taiwan as a global trail rather than a, just a cross strait Taiwan locked within the Great China Circle. Uh, or under Chinese formula of one China principle. And I, I try to uh, transcend this uh, methodological constraints. And this way we can better explain Taiwan's position in the global capitalist system, especially under the current rapid supply chain shift. Okay, this is all my uh, uh, presentation above. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jamie. So actually, it's very brief, shorter than 30 minutes. So I think the book is very important for helping us to understand the, the mechanism and how profit and and rent can be created at the same time. And that is really the secret for Chinese uh, developmental state. And also, I, I think the Chinese government is not going to like this book. Uh, because I, I see the local government have been described as like mafia-like, so I think they, they are definitely not going to like this. So uh, let's invite our first uh, discussion, uh, Dr. Michelle She. So uh, over to you, you have a floor with Michelle. Michelle, you have to unvoice. 
to unmute okay. yourself. Um, can everybody hear me now? Okay, good. Yes, um, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to, to be at this book launch, and uh, it's great to be on this panel again. Um, we did the, um, I, I was in the, the Chinese, uh, the book launch for the Chinese edition as well. Um, but for this one, I would like to approach it in a different way uh, compared to my earlier discussion uh, three years ago. And partly, um, I think that time has evolved and by reading the English book, uh, edition of Jamin's book, I have come to um, appreciate the book more, uh, thinking of the current event. Uh, so in, it's in that notion, um, I think that a good book would be, uh, should be able to you know, withstand the test. Um, so I want to uh, engage in Jamin's book with some of the classics in sociology of development uh, theories and some of the classics in understanding uh, latecomers' development. So, so let me. Um, so this is basically my book. Uh, my 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 discussion would be uh, focusing, situating uh, Jamin's book. See, uh, on on some debates on China's rise and especially in relation to development theories and understanding the global orders. Um, so the first book I want to, when I read Jamin's work this time in English, I it, the first book that came to my mind is uh, uh, Giovanni Arrighi's work, The Long 20th Century and Adam Smith in Beijing. Um, basically, uh, let me quickly re, uh, recap the ar key argument of Arrighi, so sort of kind of engage with Jamin's work. Uh, basically, Arrighi was pointed out this whole new uh, global dynamic of capital accumulation will be centered in East Asia. He, 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 the book published in 1994, and he talked about East Asia will be the new epicenter of capital accumulation. And later on in 2000s, he already picked up that he argues that China will be the center, whereas overseas Chinese diaspora will be the agent for this capital accumulation. So in that regard, basically, if you look at Jamin's work on Taishang, uh, and the Guangdong model would be that kind of the example illustrating how uh, these kind of uh, Taiwanese firms connect the Chinese to the global market, Chinese firms and Chinese to the global market. And so, so in that sense, um, so basically, I mean, Arigi's work there more provided theoretical conceptual framework, but he didn't really have much of the empirical analysis. And, uh, but one thing different is interesting is um, by situating Jamie's work in this is, I want to point it out that in this kind of war system approach, uh, Arigi's argument was basically re implying a peaceful rise because of the specific nature of uh, China, its relation with its overseas diaspora and how the SMEs, um, this kind of labor seeking investment. He talked about the East Asian uh, foreign investment is mostly labor seeking, com contrary to the prior stage. But so they would, it seems to China would be in the upper hand in making arrangement and then he's echoing a peaceful rise. But I think if you look at Jiemin's work, he's centering um, in his later second half when making evaluation of the uh, global uh, of China's rise, he's implying the hegemonic conflict. That's where China tried to take over the GVCs, the global value chains. And that's when Jie uh, Min talk about the semiconductor industry, which I'll get to in the next minute. Uh, but this is just kind of uh, try to set the context. Where can we think of Jie Min's work uh, in, in relation to some major classics? in understanding China's rise. Um, so, uh, and then I just did, I just want to show you to make the argument, um, for example, overseas Chinese diaspora as the capital accumulation um, and China's, you can just look at this chart. I think many, Jimmy probably did in his, or in his book as well. Uh, the green chart is the Taiwanese outflow uh, investment capital to, uh, to China. Uh, to, to different countries, and the green one on the top basically is all the capital is flying to China. 
since 1990s, and you can see the peak was in 2010 and kind of went downwards since. And But I just want to point it out. There's a dark green on the left. You look at 1991 to 1993. Um, actually, I just want to remind everybody, the capital flow actually was going to Southeast Asia. Uh, so was the Japan. If you think of Japan in the early 90s, South that was the, where Southeast Asia was the direction of this labor seeking. And then since the second half of 1990s, the whole world has moved their gravity of investment to China. And that's when we talk about how we understand China's rise. And Taiwanese manufacturers were key in this whole process in bringing, uh, in connecting China to the global capitalism. And that's what, was, what Jie Ming was trying to explain to us in his book understanding the, uh, the Guangdong model. So, um, so I just quickly want to sum up Jimin's key contribution, as he mentioned, it's the, it, it tried to explain how Guangdong model can, works. And one of the key highlight is the institutional rent seeking, which he just explained. Uh, I encourage those who haven't read the book uh, please uh, read the chapters uh, talking up, I think it's chapter three and chapter four, where he, he has this very detailed ethnographic account on how the Taiwanese um, firm, the Taishan Dance, was the local uh, officials. And, and that's how, and, and through this kind of uh, arrangement of um, head taxes. And I think what the contribution here is instead of asking uh, whether rent seeking would harm growth, Jiaming motivates the question differently. He, he tried to explain why, how can rent seeking and growth coexist? And so his answer is, this is through um, EOI, export oriented industrialization. The idea is uh, contrary to other places where rent seeking often harm growth and play developing countries and you know and foreign capitalists would leave and in this context eoi export industrialization set a ceiling for how much rent the local officers can extract and how much uh, the business can tolerate and so they were able and they were able to both benefit from this by extracting the surplus from labor and that's where where jie Ming talk about the the late ch particular mode of Chinese labor exploitation. And so that through this two mechanism, this is what, how make the Guangdong model possible and how the Taishan connect Taiwo, uh, the Chinese uh, economy to the global market. And this is what we understand China's rights is under this so-called EOI. Now, uh, and immediately when looking at through this matrix of the, the growth coalition, you look at the state capital, uh, the state, uh, foreign capital and, and local labors. I thought of, you know, if you look at the, uh, the another classic work by Peter Evans on um, dependent development, looking at Latin America and how Latin America turned differently was because the, the foreign capital had the upper hand and that kind of led to prolonged ISI, import substitution, industrialization in Evans' work on Brazil. So that in that sense, I think that Jie Ming was trying to engage in this, the classic of this growth coalition and how the different configurations has a different outcome. And the key here is EOI versus ISI. And to explain how rent seeking and growth was possible. Okay, uh, next then, when we talk about Jie Ming, when I read Jie Ming's work, another key contribution is when he used the term rent-seeking developmental state, um, he is basically uh, bringing the state into the GVC analysis by saying that the state is a value surplus extractor in the value chains. And I think that's, that's new because existing GVC analysis often focusing on multinationals in extracting the surplus from other, from the labor or from other suppliers. Um, but we often see the state as a facilitator in the GVC, but not directly engage in the GVC, like the value chain production. But here, he's bringing the state capital into the picture, as the state and the state, perhaps state capital into the picture, like, um, 
into this GVC analysis. Um, and so the, I think that's new in the mark, this kind of Marxist approach because um, saying that uh, it is, and then the other book I put on the on the slide is Spectre of Global China. It's uh, Li Jingjun or Qin Quan Li's recent book. Um, I think that the two books will make a good pair in understanding this approach, China, uh, you know, Chinese state capital, like a state, Chinese, Chinese state as a distinct form of capital. Um, so it, it operate, it perhaps it operates on a different logic compared to capitalist, but how that play around in the economy. And I think that's something we need to think further when you, what, and I think that's what one of the contribution that Jamie's work has laid out for us to further investigate. And that last point I'm, uh, was, I want to comment on sort of, this is where I have some, um, is, uh, we have some questions for Jiemin. It's about the implication of the Chinese development model, and or I call it the limit, the debate. Um, where I think in the the presentation, Jiemin just talked about was talking about the industrial upgrading or the Chinese path, or talking about semiconductor industry, or also uh, the the fact that the local embeddedness, uh, the Taishang in China. Uh, develop Chinese suppliers, for example, you know, the red supply chain for Apple. So that kind of, uh, the conventional argument, will, that, that kind of left the Taiwanese firms in crisis or the Taishan. Um, so in the traditional sector, in, if you look at his work, in the traditional sector, he's implying that the, uh, because of this local embeddedness, uh, Taiwanese firms have developed its own competitors, meaning the Chinese suppliers. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the, the semiconductor industry uh, where China continue to, to poach Ch Taiwanese talent. So in a sense, in this regard, Jiaming is putting forth similar to a flying geese argument that, you know, by, by basically Taiwanese Taishan will develop a competitor of its own. And that would make Taiwanese firms might be in crisis. Um, however, the, the, judging from the evidence of Jimmy's book, I'm a little bit, that's the place where I'm a bit uncomfortable with the argument here. Uh, so let me explain why. Uh, for instance, um, he talked about the, um, the, the rich suppliers, um, but my question immediately is why after 2008? Age, right? Um, but not sooner, given that China's open door policy has been over 30 years. And why we don't see the same kind of um, entrepreneurship happen earlier. Or, the, you know, if Taishan was giving, was replicating the Taishan experience, we should have seen the Hazel Bian Tojia or local entrepreneurship flourish long ago, but only after 2008. And not to mention that. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, when the U.S.-China tech war occurred, we are seeing this restructuring in the global supply chain, and uh, actually that kind of leave the f uh, so the red supply chain are far from realizing. Everybody is moving to Southeast Asia. So what I'm saying is, so judging from the evidence, I felt that uh, j following Jamie's argument on those institutional metrics between the growth coalition, it would have been, Jimmy could have just argued that, you know, um, this kind of alliance, it didn't actually generate any local entrepreneurship. And the only reason we start to see local uh, suppliers since 2008 could have been the, the changes in the local, the policies. So changes in institutional metrics, instead of arguing this local embeddedness, which I actually think it contradicts with the, the, the argument that he set forth earlier. Um, so, um, and then, um, and I want to come to the second point was, so because in, so, in some places, he seems to be ambivalent about the Chinese um, upgrading. In some places, it seems it's limited, but in some places, he seems to think that China's enter of GBC means an it's a ticket 
for the upward mobility. Um, but if you look at the a lot the global uh, economy, if you think it's a global hierarchical ladder, uh, this is where I have this book uh, by Han Jun Chang uh, about kicking away the ladder. Basically, talking about you know how the core countries they would put a lot of restrictions when the latecomers trying to catch up. So they would kick away the ladder for you to climb up, you know, upward. So basically it would be, my argument is if we look at the current situation, I would see it more as a de the end of development by invitation where, you know, the rise of China has had to do with the access to the U.S. market with overseas Chinese diaspora as the agent or the type of those like foreign firms, hybrid firms as, as agent for connecting them to a global market. But that, that path now is being closed with the tariff. So the supply chain could just easily, re this labor seeking investment would be on the go. And the implication is uh, the way specific way China developed, didn't develop the kind of local entrepreneurship one would see in Taiwan and South Korea in the first wave of this international division of labor. And then, so in that regard, this is where I think I differ from Jamin's uh, assessment on his his work, on his 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 argument he put forth on this rent-seeking developmental state. In a sense, I actually argue China um, is having, it's moving more, looking more like Latin America. China's path to development is more like Latin America, highly unequal. And especially now, as China turned inward, uh, I would anticipate a more Latin American path of this ISI, um, not very efficient. But this is just my my the hypothesis I put forth. I welcome anyone you know to pursue this topic further. And and the last point I want to make was about the the case on the semiconductor industry, the self reliance. And I think semiconductor industry, if you look at China, Chinese path for semi. It's still in that context of the globe connection, despite technology autonomy it was through this global connection. Mostly earlier work was done by foreign uh, foreign companies in China, mainly Taishan. Um, so once that door entrance is being closed, for example, there's now the export control. You just see how vulnerable the Chinese uh, Chinese technology capacity is. That's my so. So in that sense, now the the the, the semiconductor in the race to semiconductor industry, it's to me is a self reliance. But to how far the self reliance can go, that's a different debate. Um, and also, I just want to add a point. Earlier, I talked about this. Why Jamie talk about semiconductor industry? This is not. It's because being a hegemon, you need to have in the war system theory, you need to have a leading industry that could generate the most value added. And that's where semiconductor industry come into the picture. Um, uh, so it's semiconductor industry is chosen not because it's trendy or current affair, but because it's considered as uh, the industry for the you know you, you become a hegemon, you need to have a lead industry. Um, so in that sense, we can evaluate how effective this this hegemon is doing you know on the rise or um, yeah. So I just want to quickly end my. My comments here uh, was uh, four questions I put forth. I don't think that we'll have the time to go over those questions, but basically, I want to um, Jimmy talk about you know contribution to developmental state studies. But actually, I want to ask Jimmy a question: In what way uh, can we consider Chinese state contribute to the development state literature, or if China is really a developmental state? Partly, you know, you have rent seeking and development putting together. That just sounds a bit is a paradox and or you know that needs to be explained um so uh the more and the the, the other question i have is because i talk a lot about thai songs and then the relationship with the the, the in inability to generate local entrepreneurship in china so the question i want to ask is if uh following the you, you seem to portray a blind geese model but i'm more a, a seems I, I want to argue that Taizong's competitiveness. So I want to put the question on the table is where are the middlemen, meaning the Taizong or you know, in coordinating the production and not being bypassed in the GVCs.
uh, the last one, uh, just more, I want to ask you to, in, I think that was mentioned in Elizabeth Perry's forward about uh, comparing your work with uh, Barrington Moore's because you have this matrix of state, uh, capital, and pet labor. Um, so I was on to respond to you. Um, so how will you compare your work on China with uh, Barrington Moore's work? Would China fit into the realm of dictatorship through uh, coalition between the, the state and capital to achieve this rapid industrialization at the expense of peasantry? Uh, but, um, so what's your take on, on that? Um, so I'll just end my discussion here. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for many uh, important questions. I, I think it is especially ongoing chip war that everyone is knowing that uh, the previous Chinese growth model are at a growth low. And in a sense, I think Jamie's book uh, is looking at the origin and uh, the, the collusion between Chinese officials and Taiwanese merchants. But everyone is more kind of uh, more curious about more ongoing development, but I, I do I do believe Jamie do have question based on his uh, previous study, and it is also interesting that uh, Michelle's uh, effort to uh, steward uh, Jamie book began mentioning uh, Giovanni Arigi, uh, a very important so sociology of world system, and he has been a person that our second uh, discussion uh, Ho Fong had been working with uh, at his early career. Career, so that make a very smooth transition to bring Ho Fong with us. So over to you. You have twenty minutes. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this uh, uh, panel and forums, and and including me that I have been always a uh, big fans of uh, Jamming's work and and particularly this latest book, uh, uh, both the Chinese and the English version. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Just uh, give me a second to do it. Uh, here it is. Um, so actually, uh, I'm going to depart from where it's left off by Michelle and by Jamie, and 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 of course, and I uh, used to uh, work with uh, Giovanni Arrighi many years ago before he passed away, and at the same time, I'm working with him, and at the same time, I'm constantly arguing with him, disagreeing with him. Uh, 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 and, and exactly it is what the, the, the issues that I'm going to point out now that what he means in terms of, uh, and he didn't have time before he died to work out these issues. Uh, so uh, so these, these uh, pictures, I'm sure that many of us are very familiar with that, like um, uh, 10 years ago or so that uh, China started this uh, uh, st many state directed funds to throw a lot of money into um, into developing uh, different areas of high tech uh, industries uh, and microchips and semiconductor is the one key part of it and uh, and jamming books uh, the substantive analysis and in around 2010 uh, but at that time uh, and in the book uh, jamming already mentioned this limit of the uh, uh, of this rent seeking the uh, 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 different mental model that relied on uh, low cost rural originated labor and the Chinese leaders did talk about industrial upgrading since at least the mid 2000s and then um, um, accelerating in the last 10 years. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk that China is going to become a home uh, indigenous uh, innovation based it, uh, high tech powered uh, and and when they started to to develop this semiconductor industry uh starting with this state directed fund uh, to throw a lot of uh, money into this uh, uh very blasted semiconductor company and many people many media western media taiwan media uh, and and that let alone uh, the chinese media in the prc they talk about this kind of uh, up and coming semiconductor industry is going to surpass the TSMC and Samsung very soon. China will become the new center. But more recently, we see all this uh, unfolding, unrivaling, uh, particularly this uh, kind of anti corruption uh, storm has hit the sector that uh, very obviously uh, uh, Xi Jinping himself is not very happy about the progress of this semiconductor industry. And they blame the corruption in the industry in the sectors that the collusion between the, the state director fund and all these companies uh, that using this money to uh, 
allegedly to putatively develop semiconductor high-end chips. And China's already uh, man, man, managed to manage, manufacture a lot of uh, lower and middle-end chips for electrical appliance and things like that. But uh, the high-end chips is still uh, hasn't uh, had a breakthrough that Xi Jinping would want, so that uh, he cracked down on the sectors and, and, and detaining, arresting, investigating a lot of uh, big shots in the sectors are uh, allegedly corrupted. So it is it is actually this um, it's it's one case indicating the impasse or the hurdle, the big hurdle. China is still struggling to jump in upgrading its um, industry. And like 20 years ago, it is the Economist article in 2001 that the expectation, uh, speaking of the fine geese model, um, that uh, when China joined the w, uh, about to join the WTO and become a new rising center of manufacturing, that the economies has this, uh, 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 and of course, Giovanni Arrighi make this similar argument that he picked up from the mainstream uh, view at that time from Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, with the Economist. It, they are basically saying that uh, China is a big panda. It's not just uh, late coming flying uh, goose uh, because it is uh, big enough to absorb not only the uh, low end manufacturing, but also high end manufacturing, low tech and high tech at the same time. So it's going to absorb everything. Uh, it has become the leader of not only labor intensive industry, but also high tech industry. So the expectation is that it is going to be a huge panda disrupting the whole flying geese uh, formation and become the new center of both low tech, middle tech and high tech manufacturing. Uh, so it was the expectation back in 2001. And of course, then trying to make a lot of headway in moving up the value chain, uh, 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 exporting more and more uh, sophisticated high-tech products to the world. Uh, but, and I will show in a minute the data that actually that uh, China high-tech manufacturing sector is still hugely reliant on foreign technology, uh, including Taiwan technology, South Korean technology, Japanese technology, and also the United States uh, technology. Uh, despite the government, the Communist Party's uh, uh, very awareness that uh, China need to develop its indigenous innovation um, and become a tech power, self-sufficient tech power of its own, not relying on foreign uh, technology. And uh, because in the experience of Japan and Taiwan and Korea show that, that you cannot upgrade the industry by perpetually uh, through the technological transfer because the established power, economic power from the US to Japan, that they will uh, transfer some of the low tech industries to you uh, as latecomer, but uh, they will always keep uh, the most advanced sectors uh, to its own and uh, prevent it from being transferred to the latecomer. And the latecomer need to really develop a kind of innovation uh, system uh, structures uh, to learn and figure out themselves and at the same time to innovate. Uh, its own uh, products and its own technology uh, to, to become a real high-tech power. It is the path that Japan and then South Korea and Taiwan underwent and China want to replicate it, but actually so far it is not as successful as uh, it appeared. Um, then then uh, the question is, uh, to, to, to ask is why, and, and, and I agree with Michelle that uh, uh, a jamming spokes uh, talk about the question of uh, technological upgrading and talking about the fact that uh, uh, China is trying to uh, squeeze technology out from uh, some high-tech Taiwanese firm for poaching the, the uh, uh, high-tech uh, personnel from those companies um, and so on and so forth. But uh, as the substantive analysis of the book ended around 2010s, uh, it is still kind of ambivalent uh, from the perspective of that time whether China could succeed. Uh, we now have the benefit of the hindsight that China is not as successful as it wish or as it leads. Uh, and we need to ask uh, why. Um, so it is very well long that I don't, uh, I'm going to skip most of the, the slide I prepared more than I can uh, have time to talk about that this China economic slowdown after the 2009-2010 rebounds after the global financial crisis. So it created a uh, 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 profitability crisis of uh, both state enterprise and private enterprise, you see in many indicators that the uh, Chinese economy was in uh, uh, trouble uh, after 2010 and, and it hasn't uh, got away from this impasse. 
uh, yet. And then one remedy after Xi Jinping came into power is uh, to rejuvenate the Chinese economy from the impasse uh, in post-2008 uh, global financial crisis and the post-stimulus um, era is the technological upgrading. Um, and uh, we look at a lot of reports uh, showing that uh, China is already becoming a technological power, uh, leaders in the innovation uh, uh, by looking at the number of patents, for example, coming out from China. Uh, uh, so it's sheer amount in, 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 if you just count the quantity of patent, China is really topping the world even uh, uh, more advanced than US in that measurement. But uh, actually that this Bloomberg report and many other follow up uh, find out that actually many of the patents coming out from China, though is a huge amount in huge lumber. Uh, but most of them are a lot uh, commercially viable. Uh, what happened is that you count the number of patents that is actually uh, renewed because uh, the patent holder need to pay a license fees to keep the patent uh, annually. So it's, uh, for patent that is not commercially useful and viable, uh, profitable um, and meaningful, that uh, the, the patent holder just don't want to spend the money to keep renewing the, the, the patent and then release to the public domain. And the case of the Chinese patent is that most of the patents are abandoned by the patent holder within five years. Uh, after five years, 91% of the patent is abandoned, meaning that they are, they are, they are useless. Uh, so what happened is that it's just like greatly forward. They create and they, many, they manuf manufactured a huge amount of steel. So in terms of the quality of steel that they produced during the Great Leap Forward in the Mao era in the late 1950s, China is already like surpassing UK and catching up with the US. But the problem is that most of the steels are useless. Uh, uh, it's not strong enough to make anything useful. Uh, so it is an economic disaster. Uh, the Chinese situation now is not that disastrous, not, not yet that dis disastrous that uh, we, we are not going to see a famine or anything like that. But this is this dynamic similar. What happened is that the China state-led model is just like throwing a, a, a huge amount of resources to these uh, companies and labs and universities to urge them to come up with a lot of uh, research and then patents. And then so that they are under pressure to create these patents and register it and then uh, write the report and uh, telling high up how many patents that they, they, they have uh, created uh, as a kind of a uh, uh, showcase of their success and good use of the money, but they don't care whether this patent is useful or commercially viable or profitable or not, because what uh, they want to do is to report to the superior, to to to, to tell them that the money is well spent and uh, and, and we have uh, how, how many numbers of patents we have generated. So in the end, that they 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 are good at uh, creating patents in numbers, but not the quality of the patents is very high. And other indicator is that uh, when you count. The uh, intellectual property balance of payment, because uh, the, the World Bank has this database showing that how much a country is paying a foreign entities uh, to use their uh, patent technology or copyright to manufacture stuff, and how much other countries are paying that country uh, for their patent. So you come up with a balance of payment of intellectual property right. So you see that when China Interestingly, that uh, it's running an increasing trade surplus and exporting more and more high-tech product, but the China uh, intellectual property rights uh, balance of payment is negative, and it's actually the deficit is growing. Meaning that even when China moving up the value chain uh, in its products of export, um, it is relying and and need to pay more and more foreign entities for their patents. Uh, for example, as you know that uh, there are many uh, cell phones, like iPhones, manufactured in China, but many of the technology used in the manufacture of it uh, is patent outside of China, uh, in the US and many other places. So uh, when China is manufacturing iPhone or cell phone or any high tech product, they need to pay, the, the manufacturer in China need to pay the patent holder. Uh, outside China for that patent to use the technology to in the product and manufacture it. So the result is that even though we look at the trade figure and China seems to be exporting more and more high-tech product, but the technology is not owned by Chinese entities, but owned by foreign entities, Taiwan, South Korea, and, and US. So the result is that the China uh, the, the balance of payment in intellectual property right is increasing while its trade service is increasing. And the US is opposite. 
even though U.S. is running an increasing trade deficit over the year, but its uh, intellectual property balance of payments uh, is in surplus, and the surplus is increasing. Because even though the U.S. didn't manufacture mo the cell phone it used, didn't manufacture the most of the computer it used, but the other countries that manufacture those cell phones and those computers and those high-tech products, are, many of them are using U.S. technology, U.S. patents. So they need to pay the patent holder in the U.S. to use that uh, technology uh, to manufacture the products. Uh, so, so it is the... The situation uh, uh, and an indicator that uh, China on paper, it looked like it is becoming a high tech power, but uh, it is why Xi Jinping is still very unhappy about the progress because China is still very much relying on uh, foreign technology, high tech component imported from foreign countries and one of them in uh, indigenous, indigenously uh, self-sufficient technological power. Uh, so what I... Um, uh, say in in the beginning of the slide, the title of the the, the my comment is that it's the paradox of strength because it's not unique to China. Uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan in the past uh, experienced this 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 era, this phase of development. That is, they are low tech, they want to move to high tech, and then they rely on foreign technology, uh, primarily U.S. technology. And then when they don't want to pay that much patents uh, and copyright fees to manufacture the products, uh, so the, the shortcut is definitely to, to, to do this kind of illegal appropriation of foreign technology. Uh, so it is why Japan in the 60s and 70s, uh, South Korea and Taiwan in the 80s, uh, there's a lot of intellectual property lawsuit between the US and, and this latecomer. There's, uh, accusing Taiwan manufacturer, South Korean manufacturer, and earlier on the Japanese uh, manufacturer to uh, appropriate uh, U.S. copyright and U.S. Uh, patents uh, for their goods. Uh, so there's a lot of this kind of pressure from the U.S. actually early on uh, 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 when uh, this latecomer try to upgrade the technology by uh, copying and appropriating uh, this established power of uh, patents and technology. Uh, but geopolitically, uh, Japan and South Korea and Taiwan were weaker than the U.S. So when U.S. put pressure uh, back in the, the 70s to the 80s uh, on this uh, latecomer on intellectual property right, uh, U.S. won. Uh, and then uh, successfully forced and armed trees, uh, Japan and Taiwan and South Korea to develop uh, institutions, legal framework, law, um, uh, to protect intellectual property right. Uh, so, in the short run, it is a winning of the hegemon, the U.S., uh, to protect U.S. corporation interests, uh, to protect U.S. Uh, copyright holder, U.S. patent holder uh, interests. Uh, but in the long run, the, the unintended consequence of this kind of uh, Japan and then South Korea and Taiwan yielding to U.S. pressure to shore up its intellectual property institution, protection institution, is that it created an environment for indigenous innovation in uh, Japan and uh, South Korea and Taiwan uh, because that when you have set up this institution to protect intellectual property right, not only foreign companies like U.S. Com company benefit from it and then the local innovator also benefit from it and it is exactly the problem of China right now uh, uh, and it is the origin of the U.S.-China trade war Then when China want to take the shortcut to upgrade the technology to high-tech production by uh, illegally appropriating um, patents uh, and copyright from uh, the U.S. companies, from other foreign established powers, um, and it, we receive a lot of lawsuit and political pressure, and business lobbying in the U.S. is lobbying the U.S. government to put pressure on China to show up its intellectual property protection, uh, and actually that some liberal media within China, like uh, Chai Xin, who advocate reform and things like that, and also some indigenous uh, private companies. In China, including Alibaba, Tencent, and all these tech firms, that they are in support of shoring up intellectual property protection uh, institution within China. Uh, but from a political perspective, from a geopolitical perspective, it means weakness in front of the American imperialists uh, to yield to U.S. pressure to protect intellectual property rights. Uh, so, so it is what I call the paradox of strength. Uh, because of China is geopolitically so strong, so that it can withstand the U.S. and establish power pressure to show up its intellectual property protection institution. 
and then uh, prolong its period of technological upgrading through the illegally appropriating and, and, and even stealing the outright trade secret and intellectual property rights and patents and technology from foreign companies. Um, so it looked like a win for China. It withstand U.S. pass, but in the long run, China missed the window uh, or so far failed to create a kind of an intellectual property right protection institution that benefits uh, indigenous innovation. Um, because without a proper intellectual property right protection institution and environment that people don't have the incentive to innovate thing that is profitable uh, because whoever is the first to innovate that thing, everybody just copy it and then profit from it. So then you, you, you don't have this uh, uh, profit to your own. And then so you don't have your incentive to innovate. You just want to copy other people. Uh, so it is the paradox of strength because China is politically so strong. So it managed to withstand uh, U.S. pressure uh, uh, to show up in intellectual property right protection. Uh, so in the end, uh, so China is stuck in this situation that in on paper the the government can continue to throw in million billion of dollar to uh, to support this kind of a uh, high tech development, but people just like uh, got the research funding and to create a lot of uh, useless stuff uh, just to fill in the report and tell the superior who don't know anything about technology and industry uh, how good they are. But in the end, it is not innovative and it is not profitable because they don't care. The institutional environment is not there for them to have the incentive to innovate something that is really useful and innovative. It's not like the early, earlier fine geese, uh, earlier latecomer that Japan and South Korea and Taiwan because it is the paradox of weakness that they are politically weak. They cannot withstand U.S. pressure uh, on intellectual property right issue in the end that they create an intellectual property right protection environment and institution that benefit their, their indigenous innovation and high tech take off. Uh, so I actually, uh, I, uh, I feel I have uh, run out most of my time, but actually basically it is what I try to um, complement Jamin analysis uh, that, that of course China can uh, uh, bypass it by actually uh, poaching Taiwan engineers and, and, and taking um, technology directly from Taiwan to companies like uh, TSMC and, and, and what it tried to do in ter and 10 years earlier that to lure the Taiwan high tech firm to build the whole most high tech uh, facilities in China and at the same time appropriate this technology while they are in China. Uh, so theoretically China could have su succeeded but because uh, of the trade war and the energy political rivalry that is unfolding right now that it now becomes uh, politically more and more infeasible and, and, and when all this high tech lay come from South Korea to Taiwan uh, taking side uh, uh, on the side of the U.S., uh, then, then, then this uh, trick no longer work, and then so China is stuck in this kind of impasse of um, uh, uh, or hurdle of technological upgrading. It didn't. It missed the window to create a local innovative structures that uh, can facilitate the indigenous innovation. At the same time, uh, the trick of luring uh, other Asian uh, high tech company uh, to into China and then harvest their technology. Uh, uh, work less and less uh, when the geopolitical rivalry and the tension heightened and when U.S. and, and its allies are trying to create this kind of a friendly supply chain uh, uh, doctrine uh, to get uh, the manufacturing, at least the most high-tech manufacturing um, uh, out of China and go to more friendly places. Uh, so the China is stuck in this kind of a situation, and so it is why that Xi Jinping has to turn in work and, and, and uh, create a more more draconian uh, 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 control freak states uh, and 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 to withstand or to to weather the economic slowdown. Uh, so let me end here and I look forward to to response and comments by by, by Jamie and Michelle and from the audience. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Hong. I I really like the, the the paradox of strength that that China's current technological problems is actually an unintended result of its geopolitical power, so that it does not have an environment for domestic uh, technological environment uh, development. And I also like the, the analogy uh, with a great leap forward, that China has so many useless patterns <laughs> that replicate the, error, the, 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 the mistake that they make during the great uh, leap forward uh, movement. 
So I think at this moment we still have around twenty minutes. Um, I, I think uh, Jamie already had a quite a handful of questions, and before we uh, open move to the Q and A section to uh, invite audience to raise question, maybe it's better Jamie should uh, come back uh, with few response at this moment, and also for the audience we do have a slide. Uh, uh, page so you can write your question there, uh, Chinese or Xie so we we uh, hopefully we can have final minutes uh, for inviting Jamie to come back and other discussion to come back to the questions. So Jamie, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. I appreciate very much, uh, Michelle and all of uh comments and and there's no secret that I. I learned tremendous, tremendously from Ms. Chow and, and Ho Hong over the past years in the making of my own knowledge. So I really thank both of them for this very splendid comment. Um, because uh, they raised many questions that uh, most of them, you know, I, 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 I need to take more time to, to deal with. So in the, in the next five, maybe five minutes, I'll try to uh, I'll pick up some a couple of questions and try to give my uh, uh, quite kind of intuitive answers uh, to them. I, I, I will talk to the first one is from uh, uh, Michelle. Uh, I think the, the most uh, uh, um, important challenge to my argument in the book is that it's the flying piece model uh, could be replicated by, by China and it wouldn't be the kicking the ladder pattern uh, uh, reoccurs in the situation of China. And my, uh, my answer to this, uh, you know, primarily is, is yes, which I mean, uh, it would be very difficult for China in the present uh, stage uh, facing the U.S. hegemonic challenge. And since China has, you know, uh, uh, already uh, appeared to have this ambition to bypass uh, U.S domination in the technology and also in the military uh, fronts. So, you know, the, the perception of the U.S. elite has already regarded China as a ma the major strategic competitor. And, and the U.S. has already embarked on the strategic decoupling uh, with China. So I think um, the, the challenge um, is semiconductor upgrading would be the most critical moment for China to, you know, to try to upgrade its own system. And I, I, I agree with both of you. you know, I'm quite pessimistic about China's future on this front. So uh, that's my, my quick answer, but I have a, a more complicated uh, uh, answer to Michelle's question, you know, uh, because I propose a term, rent seeking developmental state. And it it sounds like an oxymoron in this uh, in this term because in our past stereotype thought, you know, development is not compatible with rent seeking. But how could China achieve that? You know, and my answer is like this: you know, the rent seeking problem is not for China only for today or, or only for the post mark period. The rent seeking is a endemic problem for Chinese political system and actually for all the third world situation and especially for the socialist state state socialist system. You know, rent seeking is intrinsic uh, in their political structure. Okay. So when I make my argument, I, I try to make some distinction between different eras, you know, in in the in the post Mao uh, Deng's reform in the very beginning for the Deng and his uh, colleagues, they are trying very hard how to circumvent the rampant corruption and rent seeking problems. Okay, so they made up some institutions and they encourage local, local officials to engage in economic. Uh, uh, activities and, and in terms, ex especially in the south, uh, in, in China's south coast, you know, to engage in export processing trade. And right at this moment, the 
four tigers, especially uh, Hong Kong taking the lead, then Taiwan becomes the most important partner to cooperate with China. Then China take, takes up this opportunity to seize, you know, to seize it, to 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 engage in this uh, export oriented industrialization. So if we can uh, we, if we can make some uh, uh, periodization, I would say in in post mild reforms stage one china development stage one begins from the early 1980s until mid old mid 2000s that's uh, china development one and during that period because of the very structure of the export oriented you know labor seeking as michelle says labor seeking and and uh, and the low human rights protection low wage uh, rate that kind of developmental model could be compatible with the rain seeking uh, in conjunction, in, in, in connection to the export sector. But now China has already stepped into the deep water, the, 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 the stage two, China development two. It needs uh, innovation, academic freedom, and it needs political liberty, and it, it needs more comprehensive proper, proper, uh, property rights protection everything you know patents ip protections and 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 this kind of protections and legal system are not sufficient to guarantee the credible commitment so china faces this problem you know and plus the u.s pressures from outside so that's why that's why uh, i agree with you you know from now on china's development uh prospects is quite dim uh, okay uh, then uh, my quick response to to Hong's comment, I I totally agree with your your estimations on current situation that China Chinese economy is facing, and uh, uh, to answer the question why China is not successful in catching up, you know, along the uh, Frankie's uh, uh, model, I think China is now facing two basic uh, problems that you already are. Uh, pointed out but i want to recap it uh, in in a short uh, form the first one is structural imbalances the structural imbalance including the most critical question that the the mass the the the, the middle class or the low middle class or the 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 uh, the, the, the bottom class they do not sufficient funds they, they they don't have money to buy more consumption goods so it's very difficult for china to develop the so-called niche in one or the master market. That's the basic problem. And and the state, and the state list, or what uh, this Perry said, the second or third Hong uh, Hong Kong Dai, Hong San Dai, uh, great aristocracy, they control the power. And in this sense, they control money too. Okay. Whoever controls power can control the financial extraction mechanism. That's the key of the communist uh, ruling. Okay. So the the, the real problem for China, I think, is the political problem, not only succession problem. Succession problem is one of them. But the basic problem is that this political elite, they control too much and they extract too much from the society. And, and they are not willing to you know, let it go. Okay, So that creates a basic fundamental problem for China to catch up because it's impossible, almost impossible to redress uh, redress the structural imbalances. So that is my take of your uh, comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Um, uh, I, I don't think we have any questions so far in our Slido page, but there are uh, some comments in our chat room in a webex. I think it's from. Uh, Yan Chai Xi about, I think these are more like a comment instead of a question uh, about protection of migrant workers and uh, middlemen in the global value chain. I think uh, all of us can read that. But I wonder, wonder, I wonder that two discussions want to come in at this moment to in response to Jamie's re response. Yeah, I would like to, yeah, the, I agree, uh, Jamie's analysis uh, about the structural imbalance and, and the CCP difficulty in overcoming this structural imbalance. And I just, like conceptually, we can we can develop uh, 
um, the more on this issue than in, in, in the book, Jamin coined this very useful uh, concept uh, of rent seeking different mental state. That is when the economy, uh, the export oriented foreign uh, investment driven and private economy is expanding. So there's state that is rent seeking, but at the same time also creating the environment for the economy to grow and the economy to continue to grow. And then the bureaucrats share some of the profit. Uh, but not killing uh, the commercial sectors and and so it is a rent seeking developmental state and right now that when the economy is no longer uh, uh, expanding as fast as it should be or could be and and even stagnating for such a long time and the local governments is uh, facing fiscal crisis debt crisis we know that a lot of local governments no longer uh, uh, able to pay their workers and and there's a increasing unemployment among the youth, particularly in the cities. And so they really, uh, we already see it happening in many places still that uh, when the economy is not growing and, 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 and prospects are not good, that the people still choose to find a government jobs of some kind uh, as a more guaranteed source of income. And, but more important is not because of the salary, but because after you get the government, become a civil servant, you have the power. And you can extort things from the society and from in all kinds of creative ways. So in that sense, that it is possibility is the possibility that the Chinese state is transforming from a rent seeking developmental state to a pure predatory state and expanding predatory state. It means people people run out of options. The economy is not going as fast and unemployed, so they just stamp it into the government. Just like the late Qing dynasty, people pay to get a government jobs. They don't get paid for being in the government. They pay for the job because after they got a job that they have the power, they have the instruments to extort things from their fellow villagers, from their fellow citizens and things like that. They become like pure mafia, uh, gangsters. Uh, the whole government is expanding like that. So it is a real possibility and, and real danger. And, 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 and we will see whether, how it would develop in the years to come. Um, can I just quickly add something to this? Um, I quite agree. Um, perhaps um, that's why I asked the question about developmental state, because even during the earlier period, I'm not sure if it's, it's appropriate to, to, to claim China as a developmental state. If you're looking at, if you use, see developmental state as a capacity to develop some, let's say, local linkage, backward linkages and local entrepreneurship. Um, but from the, the analysis, we, we actually see China neither of that. So in that sense, like I hesitate and that's why you get this outcome right now. And second point is, so following your metrics of close coalition, um, uh, I think, uh, both of your analysis, uh, Ho Fong and, and Jamie's analysis, we pointed to perhaps, uh, you know, rent seeking was possible and growth was what co could coexist because of export led industrialization. But now China has turned inward. Um, so it's not to uh, the Chinese government's interest to, you know, to co collaborate. You could, you know, you can raise the rent higher because you need the physical revenue. So perhaps that's what, you know, it's becoming like a more like a predatory behavior. And perhaps this change of institutional metrics, that means that's why I was saying China is probably heading a Latin American model. You know, when you turn, it, it, it kind of, you get authoritarianism and you get rent seeking and typical when you see in the third world. Um, so maybe that whole period of export led was just an exception period for China. Yeah, that's just kind of my speculation to, you know, if I come to the conclusion based on the things we discussed. Okay, can I pop in to-, to Not sure. Question? Okay. Sure. Go um, ahead. Yes, I, I agree with both of your comments um, on this. Uh, the emerging predatory state in China. Uh, I think, you know, the, the story of the semiconductor development in China over the past 10, 15 years uh, is a total failure, uh, vindicates, you know, vindicates the idea that the rain seeking is, is a rampant and intrinsic problem in China. You know, in, in, in China's developmental stage one, rain seeking is sort of contained by export sector, but now, since that China uh, turns inward and uh, try to rely on itself on technology, and this, this rent seeking uh, becomes you know uncontrollable. So you can see there's so much money put into the big funds, you know, just like you know put into the water and and and, and dilute, you know, and it's going nowhere. 
So, so we can see the purge, the corruption purge, and and but but you know even so, because China has to develop a, a dominant te technology, it it would be a a, a, a coming a emerging hegemon. It has to do it. So China is is investing now more money and energy into it. Yeah, but uh, but uh, according to most of the experts, you know the estimation is quite thin in in the future. And and my second uh, response to Michelle's question is that can we call China a developmental state in stage one, uh, post Mao China? My answer is positive because uh, I don't want to give it a too narrow definition of the development state, and we don't judge from the outcomes of development. We should uh, we should uh, evaluate uh, the, the process. If we, we have a true strict definition of the development state, and we only uh, see the model of Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, then this, there, there will be too few development state in the world. But in the past, in the literature, we also see Brazil as a kind of development state during some stage, right? So this Peter Evans develop, uh, dependent development. So I, I think we, we can call China during the, the stage one of the post a month period for maybe 30 years, uh, we can still call, uh, tr uh, call that, tr uh, that, that era as a kind of development state. Uh, but, we, I, but we have to add a, a qualifier. It's a rain seeking, okay? So now it becomes a rain seeking predatory state or rain seeking anti development state. This is stage now we are facing with. Thank you. Um, uh uh, um, maybe it's time for us to wrap up. Uh, I kind of have a feeling that all our panelists are kind of pessimistic at future China development. And Jamin talked about a political constraint, and uh, Ho Hong talked about a possible regression toward Qing state that is totally predatory on, on the producers. And actually, I remember that in previous Ho Hong book, uh, there's a talk about North North Korea scenario since that Xi Jinping is pursuing self deficient self sufficiency the so autarky is more like a scenario and also Abisha talk about a Latin American possibility uh, 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 continuing import substitution I think all our penalties are, are not don't see very promising with development for China at this point I'm I'm not sure whether that is the the consensus among experts maybe hope one are coming yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to add that because this kind of a pessimistic talk easily lead to people's imagination about a collapse scenario that actually I have been, as you point out, that I have been talking about this comparison with North Korean realization uh, that uh, that uh, compared to late Qing is interesting, but uh, I don't think the, the regime will necessarily like collapse like the Qing dynasty, but uh, uh, North Koreanization is, is, is a more likely scenario. Not exactly become North Korea, uh, because China's market economy, I don't think they, they will manage to stifle it in the way that North Korea stifled it, because it didn't have much to start with. But uh, the North Korean example, even Venezuela example, Iran example, Russia example, shows that that uh, for a 10 regime, if you are like um, brutal enough, intimidating enough that actually you can survive a very bad economic crisis uh, that that i'm not optimistic that china can get away from this economic crisis and debt crisis easily but i am optimistic from the or pessimistic depending on your political view that that the ccp uh, would uh, manage to 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 survive this by being more and more brutal and draconian and crazy it basically just the kind of like 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 north korea survive how many famines and economic total collapse, but the regime become actually more and more controlling and secure. So, so I, I think it's likely that China is heading toward this direction, not exactly as a North Korea, but becoming more like North Korea and particularly that uh, nuclear, nuclear armed. Thank you. So economic uh, stagnation does not necessarily spell the political collapse, right? So uh, uh, Jamie, I think I will maybe come back to you finally, so let you have final words so that we can conclude this uh, wonderful and very stimulating discussion. The final words for yeah. you, Jamie. Okay, I, I don't have any final words because there's no final words. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, to Michelle, to, to Ho Fong, and also to, uh, to 
to me issue and also and also the the colleagues at the center to help me with this such a friendly discussion and it's quite enlightening to 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 me and I think I can develop some ideas for my further work and uh, my my books in uh, progress. So thank you all and thank you all the audience uh, patients in participating in this special occasion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will say goodbye to everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Ho Hong. Thank you, Michelle. Bye bye. bye. It's a good discussion.